OK, let's get started. Uh, my name is Lou D'Andrea. And some years ago, I put together a function called manipulate. A lot of people seem to use. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about some of the features, uh, so, some of the features that are new in version 10 or version 10 awareness in manipulate. Um, and then the second half of the talk, I will be covering um, synchronicity issues, which is something I've talked about before, but something that still confounds a good number of users. And for good reason, it's complicated. Um, so I'll be talking about synchronous updating, synchronous initialization, method queued, method preemptive, those sorts of things. So let's jump in. Um, the first new in 10 feature in Manipulate I'd like to talk about is tracking function. Um, so it's always been the case that you could take one of our control functions, like slider, and rather than just having it adjust the value of a single variable to give the dynamic a second argument in which you adjust that value and possibly do some other computation, some other side effect. So in this case, this is a slider that not only changes the value of x when you, change, when you slide it, but it also changes the value of y. So this, this can be useful for a variety of reasons. It's available for all of our controls, but it was never available in Manipulate. Manipulate's nice, short syntax didn't have a place for the second argument to dynamic, because there are no dynamics in Manipulate syntax. Typically, you don't specify dynamic. Um, but this was a real shortcoming, because people want to be able to do these kinds of things in, in Manipulate. So now we have the tracking function option that you can specify. So this. This slider works ex exactly like the, the one above. Um, and instead of giving this function as a second argument to a dynamic, you give it as the right-hand side of the new tracking function option. So here we have you know, the y slider just changes y, but the x slider changes both. And as I say, this is useful throughout our control language. Locator pane is another very common, you know, locator style manipulate variables are very common. It's common to want to restrict them in certain ways. Here is an example of a locator that uh, you cannot move outside of the unit circle, no matter how hard you try, because as you're dragging it, it's, you know, the new value assigned to this variable is coordinated through this function, and this function never lets the norm uh, grow past one. So here we have a, a trapped locator. And if you have a multi locator in manipulate, so here we start with a pair of points. Um, you can restrain them each in different ways via the very convenient um, current value that lets you know which of the locator thumbs you're dragging. So here we have a pair of locators. One of them happens to sit on a line. One of them happens to be inside of a, of a circle. And they each have separate restriction functions, separate tracking functions. So the first one, I can't drag off of that line. And the second one, I can't drag out of that circle. So sure, you could put a string between them. Fixed length? That's extra credit. That, that we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that as an exercise to the listener. Um, throughout this notebook, there are going to be some bonus sections, which I will not open during this during the presentation. This notebook is already on the Pathable site, the conference website. I'd encourage you to go get the notebook. The bonus section has some additional information, examples, et cetera. Um, but I will not be opening those sections during the talk. OK. So also new in 10, this didn't quite make it into the initial release of 10, but in 10.01, we have um, a new option that makes Manipulate aware of the wonderful new multiple undo feature in the front end. Um, now, typically, you don't want, or it's, it's theoretically impossible to undo all kernel evaluations. But there are certain interface gestures that you can effectively undo by resetting local manipulate variables. And you specify which local manipulate variables you think you should care about undo through this new option. So for example, here is a button that just for convenience does exactly what the undo menu does. Um, and here's a manipulate, one of whose variables is supposed to be aware of undo. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's see. We change the value of x, we change y, change x, change y, and now we undo. And the changes to y have been left alone, but the value for x steps one 
step back in its own undo stack. We undo again, the value of x goes back to the previous state. Any guesses what happens if we undo one more time? Well, before, this exi before x existed, there was no output here, right? So this is seamlessly in the undo chain for the notebook. It's not somehow separate in this manipulate. It's, it's throughout the, the, the undo mechanism. This is very deep technology. Um, right, so we have undo track variables. Uh, we also have a new control in version 10. We have had for a while the ability to have a slider that sets one value. We now have the ability to have a slider that sets a pair of values. Um, and if you look in the bonus, you might see sliders that set some other numbers of values. Um, so we have, we have you know, exactly the same control syntax that we're all familiar with. Um, we have a, a, an interval here that we can drag around. Um, it has all of the usual options. It has a couple of extra options that are specific to intervals. So for instance, you might care a great deal about what happens when you try to pull one of these slider thumbs past the other. As you've already seen uh, by default, they don't care. You can pull one of them past the other and so you can get your intervals reversed and maybe you don't want that, maybe you do. If you don't want that, you can have one of these other method options. Push means when one thumb encounters the other, um, make sure that it always stays uh, less than or equal or greater than or equal, depending on which one you're dragging. And stop is simply, you know, you're setting up that other thumb as if it were the new endpoint for your interval and you can't drag past it. Many Mathematica functions also require a non-empty interval, and if you want to enforce that, there's an option for interval slider um, that says, don't let these thumbs get closer than some distance apart. So lots of functions like plot complains if you give it an empty plot range. Um, so, so this is a nod to those functions. And of course, that's interval slider in general outside of manipulate. Inside of manipulate, well, if you know about the control type option, you know exactly how to use this. Right? You say, give me a variable, here's its domain, this is the control type that I want, and now it appears inside of manipulate. Um, and it can do all the things that intervals can do, so here's an example where um, there is a control that uh, affects the Z range of a 3D plot. So here we're specifying the, the, the Z range. Um, Scanning through here, okay, well that's nice. Um, and it can also affect other manipulate controls. So here's a very simple example, a, an academic example of an interval control whose value sets the domain for some other control. So this interval control sets the domain for the X slider. Um, so if we change, you know, so right now X is going between about 0.3 and about 0.7 and we can change that so that we want x only to be you know, in a very small range around 0.8. So, so we have the usual sort of self-referential kinds of things that you might get in, um, in other sites of controls. We have that with interval slider as well. Okay, and the last new option I wanna talk about is um, affects the bar family of functions, so we have radio button bar, setter bar. There are a couple of different ways to lay these out um, in Manipulate. Uh, so hopefully you've all seen and used them. Um, but when you have more than a couple of choices, they get a little bit awkward looking. So the default display has them running off the side of the page. If you know enough to set the appearance to the word wrapping version, well this is fine, but maybe some of the buttons aren't quite as beautiful as they could be. Wouldn't it be nice if I could set these all up in some sort of nice rectilinear, you know, columnar thing? Um, and now we do have that ability. So we have, instead of just appearance, row, horizontal, vertical, we have appearance, vertical dimensions, and appearance, horizontal dimensions that lets you specify, I want these things arranged um, in columns, and I want there to be three columns and however many rows it takes, right? Um, and this works for all of the bar functions. It works outside of manipulate as well. Um, but I think this is a very nice, this is a very nice adjustment to, uh, to those sets of functions. Um, and also uh, another nice set, uh, nice change to checkbox bar and radio button bar. It used to be the case that 
you have these beautiful displays, but you have to find the little control to press you, instead of pressing anywhere on the label. And so there's a, nice, there's a, there's a new convenience, uh, method active, that says, you know, go ahead and click anywhere you want, and these things will be activated. Um, so uh, something we could have done from the beginning, and maybe we should have done from the beginning, and it's now available. Um, those of you that are interested in columnar layout may also be interested in a new in version 10 function multi-column that does kind of this automatic padding and laying out into columns arranged either horizontally or vertically. Horizontally or vertically. Right. Okay. So that ends the new in 10 half of my talk. Um, and again, all the bonus sections are staying closed during the talk. I'd encourage you to go to the conference website and grab the, the notebook or chat with me about it afterwards. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about synchronicity. So, you know, manipulate's fine and everything, but Mathematica lets you do evaluations that take days. How do you reconcile an interface that the user is supposed to interact with and get fast results, you hope, with evaluations that might take, you know, an arbitrary open-ended amount of time? How do you handle, what, what, what are the tools with which you can handle those, those situations? Well, let's look at the kinds of things you run into now if you don't know about what I'm about to talk about. Um, so if you have a first argument to manipulate that might take a long time, well, it goes off and tries, and I'm using pause here as a stand-in, but this could be you know, any long-running evaluation. Um, so it goes off and tries to do something for a few seconds, and then the front end says eventually, you know what, you're taking too long. You've had enough. Um, we're going back to the user. Or you might have a single, so, so, so that's an example of an evaluation that, that is done every time you move the slider. If you had an evaluation that just needed to be evaluated once, well maybe you think you can isolate it in the initialization option and say, okay, well I'll pay the penalty up front and then I'll have a nice responsive interface. Well, unfortunately that didn't work um, because the initialization is also subject to this short timeout. Um, and, you, and you see other places where you might have long-running evaluations. So what do you do in this case? What's actually happening here? And, and what, are the, what are the tools that, you're, at your, um, that you can use to deal with this? Okay. So one of the things, before we get to the tools, one of the things to realize is that starting in, uh, let me say it this way, before version 6, in Mathematica 5 and before, the front end and kernel communicated over a single math link. Um, there was only one line of communication between the kernel and front end, and that was your evaluation queue. That's how your evaluation queue was, was handled. Um, but starting in version six, as maybe some of you know, we now have multiple links connecting the front end and kernel, which allow us to do things like this. While the, the kernel is saturated, sitting in this while loop, doing nothing but waiting and printing, um, I can still interact with an interface that goes off and uses the kernel. So how is this happening? What features are built into Mathematica that allow this kind of thing to happen? Um, and it's the, it's the communication over multiple links that's the key. And there, so there are, there are two main ways in which the front end and kernel communicate with one another. And for purposes of this talk, I'll call them synchronous and asynchronous. Um, Synchronous updating is the new thing we invented in version six that allows this sort of fast updating um, while the kernel is otherwise busy. So we have the ability to do preemptive evaluations. You know, the kernel's busy, but you can still ask it to do something. Um, these evaluations are intended to be very fast. They're expected to be very fast. Um, and so the front end has things, has nice um, has, has ways of making them even smoother by hiding all of the additional bells and whistles that you usually associate with evaluations, like cell brackets highlighting, running appearing in the title. None of that happens for preemptive evaluations. Um, but also, the front end completely waits while this evaluation is happening. So it's, it's not only intended to be fast, but if it's not fast, then the whole front end will wait for you we'll wait for this evaluation to, to, to return. And because of that, we can't wait forever. I think the default timeout is something like six seconds. Um, so this is, this is sort of the default mode for dynamic. It's the default mode for many controls. It's not the default mode for shift return evaluations. Shift return or asynchronous evaluations, they sit in a first in, first out queue. 
They, um, they can handle evaluations that run for days. You get cell bracket indications running in the, in the title bar. You get this preemptibility that we talked about. And of course, you can keep typing while your evaluation is running. So how do you access these two different evaluation modes inside of the dynamic language and in particular inside of manipulate? So inside of the dynamic language, we have an option to dynamic, which basically says use synchronous updating for this dynamic or use asynchronous updating. The default is synchronous, which times out after a few seconds. So here is a minimal example of that dollar aborted. Also notice the spinning beach ball. The front end is completely waiting for the kernel to respond here, right? And it finally says after six seconds, sorry, that's enough. Um, and we have a different indicator when you have a, an asynchronous dynamic. Notice the cell bracket is lit up. We have a place now that's reserved for the result when it comes back. Um, and eventually it comes back and populates. So synchronous updating is a dynamic option. It's also a manipulate option. We looked at initializations. There is a similar um, flag that lets you say whether or not you want an initialization to run synchronously. So here we have, um, we have the default mode, which is, yes, I want this initialization to be synchronous. But of course, that's going to time out. We have, notice we have no indication that it timed out, other than the value of x didn't become 1. Um, in manipulate, you have some indication. In dynamic module, the, the lower level primitive, you do not. Um, but if you set synchronous initialization false, then OK, you have this synchronous dynamic, which was, has, shows x to be 0. The initialization is still churning away. And when it's done, you see the value of x has changed. Again, synchronous initialization is a dynamic module box option. It's also a manipulate option. So if you have manipulate initializations, you can use it. Um, a few other controls are aware of the two different evaluation modes. Button and action menu have a method option, which lets you specify queued evaluations versus preemptive evaluations. Um, and by default, they are preemptive. But if you have long-running evaluations, um, say you have a button that goes off and hits the network, and you don't know what your network latency is going to be, or you have something that opens a dialog box um, and asks the user for something, um, you should always use method queued um, in that case. And action menu and button are the two that, that can do that. And file name setter, there's not even a choice for method because it always opens a dialog, so it always has method queued burned in. Right. So in short, manipulate uses the same defaults for synchronous initialization that dynamic module box does. It uses a new default for synchronous updating automatic, um, which actually allows the front end to switch back and forth between synchronous updates and asynchronous updates as it sees fit. I'm going to skip a couple of sections here and go straight to uh, the icing. Control active is the way that you interact with that synchronous updating automatic, and you specify which are the fast rendering and the slow rendering bits. So um, here we have a control. Well, let me point out control active. First argument is the thing that evaluates quickly. It will happen over the preemptive link and be expected to be fast. The second argument happens over the queued link, can take as long as it wants. And these automatically swap back and forth while you're interacting with the control. So while the control is active, you're seeing the draft fast, the first argument. Um, and as you release, then notice that the cell bracket lit up briefly when I released. That's because that last update is an, is a, is an asynchronous update. Right. So rule of thumb, whenever you have a long running thing, whenever you have to ask the user something, whenever you might hit the network, make sure that you think about synchronous updating and synchronous initialization. Um, and there are more and more functions in Mathematica that hit the network. There's quantity, sometimes hits the network. Entity, sometimes hits the network. Geographics, I think, sometimes hits the network. We have Wolfram Alpha. We have data packlet functions. So it's important to keep this distinction in mind, I think. Right. So um, that is basically what I wanted to cover. Um, thank you for your attention. And I think we have a few moments for questions.